So hi everybody, really nice to see you this morning. Uh, tomorrow, today you're at the Eagle Market when Greed for Fame benefits large-scale botnets presentation. First, we wanted to present ourselves. So my name is Masera. I'm a cybersecurity researcher at GoSecure Inc. I'm sort of the black sheep within the research and development um, team at GoSecure because I'm the social scientist. I've got a economic background and a master in criminology. And also, I'm the treasurer of the Nordtech Conference, which is an awesome conference that takes place in Montreal. Olivier is going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. Hi, I'm uh, Olivier, a security researcher at GoSecure. I'm in charge of the training session at Nordtech Conference and competition. So, just a shameless plug quickly about Nordtech. It's in Montreal, beautiful uh, May uh, 2017. It's a non for profit organization, conference, capture the flag competition probably the largest on-site capture the flag competition in the world. Training awesome people, and we are looking for speakers, so that's why the shameless this plug here. Thank you so much for that. Okay, and just quickly, we wanted to present you the agenda of the presentation. You know you're in a presentation where we'll talk about a botnet that conducts social media fraud, and we'll try to place it in its market. Uh, so quickly, we'll go through Linux Moose, which is the name of the botnet recap. Uh, we'll show how we build our honeypots uh, for analysis. We'll also uh, present the man-animal attack that we've done on the botnet. And then we'll go more on the social side uh, and talk about its operation on social networks, uh, the buyers, who are they, uh, an overview of the seller, and we'll talk about the potential, potential profitability of the botnet. Uh, this is a joint research between three organizations. It's a good example of how we can actually put all our skills together. So go secure ESET and University of Montreal. So I'll give the floor to Olivier for the next 25 minutes, uh, and we'll start. Yeah, so let's uh, come back to uh, Linux Moose uh, to have a, like a, a quick recap. I'll uh, go on the podium. <laughs> All right, so uh, Linux Moose, of course, a uh, picture of a moose to represent it. In a nutshell, what it does is it affects routers uh, mostly, but uh, we now need to call it Internet of Things devices. Technically speaking, without any marketing, you know, uh, buzzwords, it's actually embedded Linux systems with a BusyBox user land. So this is what it needs to uh, affect it. It has a worm-like behavior, so it, it uses to spread Telnet uh, credential brute force, so admin, admin, admin1235, and stuff like that. Uh, it its main payload is a proxy service. So Inside of one's uh, function in assembly, it, it supports proxying traffic using SOX v4 or v5, HTTP and HTTPS. Pretty interesting how they, they built it. It's pretty naive. Uh, and it's used to proxy traffic to social media sites. So this was really a moment where we were like, what, how, why are they doing that? It's unclear. Uh, so this was the first time we did an analysis of it, and um, the, what we'll present today is the, our subsequent analysis of that botnet where we attacked and decrypted the, the traffic. The reason we needed to attack the botnet is that all of the traffic going to the social media sites was encrypted. 99% of it was uh, over HTTPS instead of HTTP, which meant that it was protected and encrypted. So quick recap of the timeline. Uh, it was discovered in November uh, by ESET in 2014. I was working there at the time, and we thoroughly reverse engineered it in uh, early 2015, uh, me and Thomas Dupuis. We published a paper a, few, a month after the command and control infrastructure went down. It was taken offline. And in September 2015, a new version uh, was out that we collected in our uh, the honeypot at ESET. All of the really gory and technical details are available uh, in the paper we published and the, the presentation we've done in the past, so we, we won't focus on the gory details for now. So, uh, why Linux Moose? Well, it comes from a string ELAN, which is present in the, um, the binary file. ELAN, uh, in French, you can pronounce it ELAN, and ELAN is actually a moose in, uh, in French. So this is the, like, the French-Canadian, I guess, twist that we could put to it, and this is why we chose that name. After we published a paper, people told us, you know, the internet is nice, you kind of crowdsource work, a lot of people tell you you're wrong, and they tell you why. And so they told us, no, 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 that's not for a moose that they had this string in there. It's because they love old cars. So they said it's the Lotus Elan, the reason why it's the, the, this Elan string was in there. 
And then other people from our company, ESET at the time, said, no, 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 you got this wrong. <clears throat> this, this is about a Slovak uh, music group called Elan. Uh, so the people from the Czech Republic or Slovakia know about that band. It's a rock band from the 60s, and they are still active right now. So following ESET's report, which got interesting media uh, coverage, the command and control infrastructure went dark, as I said, uh, until September 2015. And so this is where we thought that it was uh, an opportunity to study Linux moves in a broader sense. So instead of just publishing about the technical people, uh, the technical portion and the network protocol that it used and, you know, uh, your typical malware analysis uh, with uh, IDA screenshots and stuff like that, we decided to take a step back and uh, try to study the market. And this is where I, uh, this is like kind of at the time where I met Masara, uh, who uh, we met at a, a scientific conference in Canada. And I was like, oh, someone like that can definitely benefit research like this if uh, she can, you know, do some um, statistical analysis and more in depth, you know, trying to understand the market and talk about it in, in scientific and economic words, stuff that I couldn't do by myself. So since I wanted to study Linux moves again, we needed to catch it. So we needed to catch the version two. The, of course, the changes they made made, it, made the work um, to catch it more complicated to us because they were able to adapt to uh, the report that we've published. So to catch them, what we did is we built a honeypot. It's uh, software-based instead of hardware-based, so it's uh, easy to deploy in the cloud, cheaper. The only uh, disadvantage is that it's easy to fingerprint a software-based honeypot. Uh, we use the low interaction honeypot. Uh, the reason why is everything is emulated, so it's less dangerous. If you deploy high interaction honeypot and they are compromised, people can use them to attack the internet and you're kind of part of the problem. But if you use low interaction, you can kind of control what is emulated or not. Requires less monitoring. Uh, we sideloaded uh, an emulation with an uh, ARM virtual machine, which we infected. So we had the real malware running instead of a fake client or something like that. So we really uh, were running the, the real payload. Well, the, the architecture in a nutshell is the following. So you can see on the left hand side the, the, the ARM emulator that we use is QMU. We use the Debian uh, ARM image and we put the, planted the binary in there. On the right hand side uh, it's the Kauri honeypot that we chose, the low interaction honeypot. We emulated a router user land so the file system mimicked uh, really a real router that we uh, aimed for has a busy box environment and the, te the telnet service. I'll come back about the network portion a bit later. So why did we choose Cowrie? Uh, we chose it because it was written in Python and Twisted, which were fami familiar to us. Uh, as I said, it we could emulate a full file system and the output of commands to mimic a really a consumer router, exactly the, the target that we have in mind. It was actively maintained uh, compared to the previous version, where, which uh, Cowrie is based on, which is called Kipo which was uh, no longer maintained. Easy to modify since it was uh, in Python. Uh, it has machine parsable logs. This is important when you deploy, you know, 20 honeypot and you, you have not, not a lot of time to look at them. Uh, you need something to be able to query the logs quickly and have relevant output, stuff you're interested in. Has a real time uh, log replay, which is really cool because you can see if the attacker or the, the people interacting with your honeypot you can see if they are a machine, a script, or a human, because you see the typo, you see the, the backspaces, you see it in real time. So it's a really interesting uh, mechanism. The only problem is, which was pretty big for us, it, it has no Telnet support. So we know that our worm uses Telnet or relies on Telnet. So what we decided to do is we decided, I looked at Cowrie's architecture, and we decided to contribute Telnet support to Cowrie. I was able to uh, figure out how to reuse the most of the, the, the terminal emulation and all of the complicated stuff that Kawi already implemented and just hook Telnet at the same spot that they hooked SSH and have it all work. It sounds uh, a lot more easy than it actually was and this is mostly due because Twisted is really complicated and because VT, uh, virtual terminal emulation, is also complex. But it's still a matter of, of, uh, of a few days of development, not, not that much. And I'm happy to say that uh, the upstream project, so uh, Michael, who is in charge uh, of the project, he uh, integrated our Telnet support to the, the Kauri upstream project. So now everyone can use Kauri to you know, attract IoT style uh, malware. 
Moving on to the other uh, Honeypot components, uh, the infected host that we had on the left hand side of the architecture diagram is uh, running QMU, as I mentioned. We use Aurel's uh, Debian Linux ARM images. We planted the Linux Moose binary in there and then we ran it. So how do we um, attach all of these components together is uh, through firewall rules. So we use IP tables to send the, the net piece to the, our low interaction honeypot on the right hand side and we uh, use the IP tables rules to redirect the HTTPS and the proxy traffic to a man in the middle proxy service which I'm about to talk about. And the whole thing, uh, again, you know, I'm kind of, uh, if you can get gather all the traffic, gather it. So we, I, we added a dump cap, which is part of Wireshark, to just grab PCAPs of the whole thing, all, all the interactions. So yeah, uh, about the man in the middle proxies uh, component, uh, we needed to attack Linux Moose, as I said earlier, in order to strip the, the, the HTTPS traffic and have access to the raw traffic in order to really understand how they were performing the fraud and if it was working. So, removing the S from HTTPS, the meta metadata itself was interesting, but we wanted to see the fake profiles and the potential buyers and to be able to document them. So, before we, on the first version of our analysis, we were still able to know that it was going to social media sites because we had access to the certificates which was which is sent as part of HTTPS. So we looked at the common name in the X509 certificates and we were able to say, oh, this is going to Facebook, this is going to Instagram, this is going to YouTube. Uh, but it's, again, as I said, this was only metadata, so it limited what we can study. So I'm about to uh, explain a little bit how we perform the, the attack. So as you can see here, this is uh, how the bots are relaying traffic without uh, us in this interfering with it. So the, there is an end-to-end TCP connection from the proxy client to the, the bot, the infected host. Uh, proxy client is actually the operators. We don't really know how, they're, you know how they operate at their end, so we just called it generically proxy client, but we could have written operators or you know, bot masters. So TCP connection from them to the infected host, and then it starts again from the infected host to the targeted social network. But this is, uh, so this is two TCP connections, but the SUX tunnel, the, so the, the proxy component, actually you know, creates an end-to-end -end tunnel between the, the operators and the targeted social network. And inside that tunnel, the HTTPS traffic is, uh, is uh, tunneled. Uh, because of the, um, the traffic is tunneled from end-to-end -to, -end to the social network, that HTTPS is encrypted and authenticated. So it, you know, from them, it's like, like anyone would use on a browser going to Facebook or stuff like that. It's conventional connection. So what we did for the attack is we in inserted a man in the middle attack component after the infected host. So we terminate the SOX proxy. So you still have two TCP connections from the client to um, the infected host and from the infected host to the targeted social network. But the SOX proxy tunnel is terminated in our man in the middle attack component. And so we terminate the HTTPS at the same time. And, we, and it is recreated on the other side with the social network. So there are kind of two flavor of purple here. The lightish one means that since we inject and terminate the connection, the HTTPS connection, we need to provide a certificate. And we, so we need, we decided or we use a tool that will sign that certificate with a CA that is generated by us. Which means that the connection is encrypted, but it's not authenticated. They, uh, if a, a real user, end user browser would, would be doing the, the, the traffic, the, the carrying the information, they would get a certificate error because they don't trust our, our CA, our certificate authority. So this is where we kind of needed to cross our fingers and hope for the best that it was automated and that they, were, they didn't care about the security of the, of the thing. But we added a little component, uh, or we tried to tip the luck in our, in our side, as you'll see in a second. Uh, so the darker purple is a real, you know, authenticated and encrypted channel from our man in the middle component to the targeted social network. So how we mounted the attack, the attack is we redirected the HTTPS and HTTP to the man in the middle process using IP tables. 
we avoided tra trapping the CNC, the command control traffic, because it is HTTP. So we needed to set that aside again using IP table rules. We crafted the certificate authority and we crossed our fingers. So that certificate authority, we decided to mimic a TLS inspection appliance. So we figured these guys, since they are infecting the whole internet, you know, uh, with, uh, they, they must see a lot of stuff out there in the wild. <clears throat> so we decided let's take a, a known product who is doing TLS interception, mimic that root certificate, and hope for the best that they already saw something like that in the wild and that they will say, oh yeah, this is a security appliance. We still want to infect that, uh, that device. At first, uh, it failed. But because we used the uh, uh, better cap instead of what the component uh, we decided to uh, use on, uh, first, we, for better cap, we needed to remove the HSTS bypass. Uh, so uh, HSTS is a HTTP trick to uh, prevent you from, um, uh, like, like to uh, avoid the, the, the fact that you, you first connect to a service in a non-HTTPS way. So we needed to uh, bypass that because uh, H HSTS bypass relied on DNS. And b due to the nature of the SOX proxying, we didn't have access to the DNS traffic to temper it. So it couldn't work in the environment. We patched it. But still, after that, it used a lot of resources. It sec faulted. But the most important reason why BetterCap didn't work in our context is because the, it didn't produce machine parsable logs. So there was no way for us to do a, a really high level analysis of uh, tens of thousands of HTTPS connection. It was, it, we would have to parse you know, uh, complex uh, text uh, in order to extract meaningful inf information. So what we did in the end is we tried another tool, which is man-in-the-middle man proxy. We ran it in transparent mode, uh, transparent proxy mode, sorry. It, uh, and it has been really stable and running for months and has a library to parse logs. So the, their logs are in a machine format and it, they provide a really high level, you know, get URL stuff uh, 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 interface library uh, uh, in Python, which is really good. So with this and our fake certificate mimicking a Fortinet appliance, we were able to succeed. So what we think is that the operators uh, disregarded the certificate error they probably use a library or automation tool that has the checks disabled by default, or they, they had it enabled from the beginning, but they faced too many you know, problems with it, and they just decided, hey, we don't care, we, we, like, we, don't, we just want more you know, traffic, we don't mind if there is one or two error here or there. So this, is, this was good for us. <laughs> and it's most like, likely because it was automated. So at this point, we were like, yes, we have access to the unencrypted social media traffic proxied through the botnet. And I'll let Masara uh, continue a little bit with that. Just a little bit, yeah. Uh, so where we're at, right? Because it's a process in our research that we follow. We've got now, whoops, sorry, several infected hosts actively used by op botnet operators. We've got HTTPS traffic in plain, oh, you don't see what I see, right? Okay, we got HTTPS traffic in plain text, we've got CNC traffic, and while we were doing that, I also went online and did some open source research. So we've got as well publicly available seller market because it's openly sold, so I gathered lots of data on the prices and the quantity that were sold on social media fraud. So yeah, our findings, sort of the whole research that we did can be summarized around five features, and we want to present them through those five features to like be structured, but, so Linux Moose is sort of involved in a clever scheme that's stealthy, constantly adapting, creates no direct victims, is hiding in plain sight, and has a large potential profitability. So we'll go through all those five characteristics, and uh, we'll do the in parallel the sort of market analysis. I'll give back to Olivier for two of the first two features, uh, the micro, and then I'll go micro. Yep, so the two, first two features she described are more maybe technical, so that's why I'll cover them quickly. Uh, so why we think it's uh, stealthy? Uh, it's because it has no x86 uh, version. So I've been studying IoT malware for two years, and uh, I never uh, saw, except for, for, from, uh, for Linux Moose, IoT malware that, that didn't have an x86 version. The reason is like, you know, they, they have their C code and they have their cross compiler setup done, so why not have an x86 version? The problem, or why it's stealthy to not have an x86 version, 
is because all of the industry's best tool and minds are around x86. Uh, the telemetry, you know, from AV company, all of the products, everything is, you know, targeting like IDA Pro is really a lot better at reverse engineering x86 than ARM. ARM support is getting there, but I mean, Moose's principle, what I most uh, worked on was the MIPS version. So has no decompiler uh, uh, for MIPS and stuff like that. So this is kind of them avoiding to infect servers and honeypots, which are usually also x86. Uh, it does no ad fraud, DDoS or spam, which was really unusual for us to see something like that. So really focused on this social media, you know, proxying stuff. And it has no persistent mechanism. So the reason we think uh, it's stealthy is because let's say your grandmother has a router and uh, she needs to reboot her router from time to time because you know the, the infection makes the router crash or out of memory. And we've saw that in the, in the past, like they were updating the malware to remove or add out of memory checks in it. So we know that they had you know, memory leakage problems or they had, you know, they infected really low memory systems and it, it, and it didn't work there. So let's say your grandmother's uh, router is crashing from time to time or her internet is not working well. Well, she, re she will reboot the, the router. If the, if the malware has persistent, she would reboot the router and then it would fail again and then she would reboot the router again. And then at some point she would get tired and throw the thing away and buy a new router which will not have Telnet exposed by default and default credentials, we hope. Uh, but the industry is, is a lot better than it is actually in that regard. So it shouldn't have Telnet exposed. And so this is why we think there is no persistent mechanism. If you, uh, you, the grand, grandmother in question reboots the router and it's, not, it, and it's working fine for a few weeks, then for her it's just normal because of the lack of persistence. But you have to remember that they infected her router because of weak telnet credential exposed. So they will always come back from the same door. It's just that instead of you know, constantly having her reboot, it will be every several weeks, and which, will, which is enough for them to you know, operate. So this is why we think it's a stealthy technique for us to stay under the radar. Now, constantly adapting, this is more about the changes that are, were implemented after ESET's report. So what they did is uh, the, uh, uh, the command and control IP address in the f for the first version was hard-coded in the binary, which is not a good thing, because if you do any type of hunting on VirusTotal, if you have access to the files through sharing uh, between the AV vendors, you have the command and control infrastructure. You know where it is and you can go after it. So what they did is instead it's provided via the command line when it is performing the infection. And so since they also uh, didn't want people just running Honeypot to have the uh, IP address in the plain text, they decided to obfuscate it. So it's packed as an integer instead of a string and it's XORed with a constant value, a four byte value, which is again, uh, you can find through re reverse engineering. But this means that you need to have the binary file and you need to have uh, to, to actually witness an infection in order to have the uh, command and control IP address. Of course, the uh, proxy service port changed, so this was a hard-coded port, really easy to filter at the ISP level, you know, in a stateless way, a port like that, which is, from the first version, it was uh, 10,073, second version is 20,012, uh, so they just changed it, you know, say, so that anyone looking at that port uh, traffic for SOX proxy traffic could, uh, couldn't um, find it anymore. They also updated the bot vetting process. So this is a small change that they did on the command and control infrastructure side where uh, the, the, the infection needs to be actually performed by another Linux Moose instance. Otherwise, you won't receive jobs uh, after you are successfully hooked on the command and control uh, you know, protocol. So this is just a simple way for them to just make sure that there is less researchers that are after them. Uh, they also updated their HTTP protocol. So now it, it used to be on port 80, uh, but it was raw binary. So if you would hit the, the, the IP address with a browser, you would get you know, garbage. Uh, but now what they did is they wrapped it inside an HTTP looking protocol and the, binary, the old binary exchange is done inside set cookie and cookie headers. 
So now it's really looking like a legitimate uh, web server. And if you hit it with a browser, you you get the a famous it works page. It's like an you know an unset up server. But if you look at the header, the network traffic, you see set cookie, which means that and this is where they encode it. And instead of encoding the binary in base 64 or something like that, they just do a very you know basic and and strange like most malware. Uh, plus plus 65 to make sure that it's in the ASCII range and that it will not blow up the um, the HTTP protocol or spec. So this is why we say it's constantly adapting. It changes just as little as it needed to be able to stay under the radar and avoid researchers' attention. And I'm pretty sure that after this talk, unfortunately, we will have the same problem and we'll have to go back at them again because they will have changed the stuff we mentioned. Yeah, I, I, in fact, I, I should have plugged that here, I forgot. Uh, ESETS did a, a blog post this week about the technical changes, so in more detail. This is just a slide with no code. They have code, they have updated IOCs, and all that good stuff. So you should definitely go and check check that. So the next, the, the last stretch is Ms. Sarah, who is going to share her, her our findings or her findings. Yeah, okay. So um, the third feature was hi, no direct victims. And we'll just go through the analysis and you'll understand why we say that. But uh, what's, uh, what's social media fraud? Because we often say that, but like it's not. It's the process of creating false endorsements of social networks accounts in order to enhance a user's popularity, popularity and visibility. We came up with that definition, but it's mostly just creating fake follows and fake likes online. So you go into Instagram, create fake accounts, and just go and like other people, right? And when we had the, the traffic decrypted, then I could analyze it, and what we did is mostly just having an overview of where the traffic is going from Linux Moose, and we found out that it's mostly going through Instagram. And it's going to Instagram through all honeypots. So we had many of them, and they could have focused on different social networks. But the thing is, they're all focusing on Instagram and doing a bit more on other social networks. Uh, they're doing 8%-ish on Twitter. And then there is Periscope, Flippergram, and Kiwi, which are really sort of unknown social networks that we'll talk a bit more later. But yeah, mostly focus on Instagram. And what does it do on Instagram? It performs likes and follows, but it's only 13% of its activity. So 87% of its activity is actually a walk through creating a fake like or a fake follow. So that's quite interesting because it shows us that the botnet still needs to work out and sort of try to look legitimate and human and doing requests that will look like a human is browsing through Instagram. So we found various modus operandi, and please don't focus on that blog text. I know we're not supposed to put that up. But I just give you here an example of a modus operandi we can call of 15 requests that the botnet's going to do before creating a like or follow. So it'll go through, it'll log into its fake account, and then it'll go visit its inbox, which is always empty, right? It'll go and look for potential recipients to send a message. It'll visit its own personal timeline. It'll go and visit the, the profile of the person it's planning on actually liking the fake, the fa the la fake liking the account, if I could say. So we found like various modus operandi. It, it ranged from like shorter ones to longer ones to actually avoid being uh, flagged as spam by Instagram. And that actually worked. The success rate of Linux moves creating fake likes and fake follows, it's almost 90%. So in 90% of the time, they're fine, and Instagram doesn't flag them, and oh, they create a fake likes and a fake follow, and they monetize it. In 11% of the time, uh, we actually see Instagram flagging it and saying, we're against spam. If you've got problem for us to stop your request, please contact support. So still, we don't know how they're like flagging 11% and letting go 89%, but there's still small um, flagging. But you know what? It's nice, because the follows, it's not nice. It's The follows, they don't actually last. So what we see is they're putting a my God, they're putting a lot of efforts into creating fake likes and fake follows, but they're not putting any efforts into keeping them online. So here I give you an example of a fake account. It has zero posts. It has one follower, because yeah. And it's, it's following actually 262 people. And sometimes it goes up to 800 people. It always has some sort of boring pictures of either a building, a plant, or an animal. And we try to look if we could like sort of trace back the pictures, but it's probably playing with the pixels because we couldn't. But in the end, you know, it just it looks like a bot. It's not hard to be to say that's a bot. And Instagram is actually flagging them often. So 
Of the 1,700 fake accounts that we saw going through the traffic, when we went on Instagram, end of August 2016, so that's six months after having Honeypot starting, well, 72 72% of them were suspended and didn't exist anymore. So what does that mean? Well, it means that buyers are getting ripped off. They're buying for fake likes and fake follows, but in the end, they're not, they're, it's not a quality service. And even though they get it like right away when they buy it, it's not going to last. They're not, they're not going to be famous online anymore in a few weeks or a few months. But talking about the buyers, right? who are they? Because what's great about the traffic that we had is that we could see to, whom, to which profile Linux Moves was actually creating fake follows and fake likes, so we could see the potential buyers. So we, we went on with a, a methodology that I'll refine for future articles, but the whole idea was to first look at profiles on which follows were performed by Linux Moves, go and see uh, active profiles that were owned by people or uh, enterprises, businesses, that had either lots of followers, but that's not the main point, it's mostly that when they posted pictures, there was no reaction. So the idea is if you, you've got a million followers and you post a really nice picture and two people react, then it just shows you that you probably have a million fake followers, right? So I give you an example here of a designer. They have get 150,000 followers and they post pictures and they're actually having like 25 people reacting to it. So the ratio is really low. And analyzing those buyers, potential buyers, created sort of three large categories that can be overlapping a bit, but that gives you a great overview of who are the people that actually buy botnet services, right? <clears throat> Sorry. So you firstly get business-related accounts. So we saw lots of accounts on which uh, there would be a description, like this one, I don't know if you see it, but it's got uh, 16,000 followers, it's an electronic cigarette business. And they, in all their descriptions, you'll have a link to their, uh, their websites where you could actually go and buy. We found lots of uh, watches, uh, jewels, uh, sh clothes, shoes, all those businesses that are existing only online. And some of them look quite shady, so you don't really know if actually you're going to get the product you get shipped or not. But still, uh, so yeah, there was mostly online. There was a few as well that they were some sort of small businesses that existed physically, like a restaurant in Kuwait or a pizza shop in Bali. So those people would actually, we saw some of those businesses as well. We saw as well uh, lots of business-related accounts. So it's, it's a business, but it's mostly self-centered. And that may be a result of the Instagram social network. It's... Um, it's mostly people that, uh, well, here, sorry, I've got an example. It's a guy, he's a web developer, but, and he's calling for projects in his profile description, which I blocked because if you wrote that profile description on Google, you'd find it right away. But uh, he's calling for projects and everything, but most of his profile is focused on his wealth and his uh, coolness, I guess. And he's got a million followers, a million people following him. Uh, those business-related accounts were uh, really, sorry, centered around individual. We saw lots of um, hair designer, web developer, TV presenters, and, and the like. And tattooists, yeah. And finally, we had those aspiring celebrities. So those people are trying to break in the showbiz, but probably it's harder. They're, they're, yeah, it's harder to break in the showbiz, so they're trying to give themselves a bit of legitimacy. Uh, here's a singer. He's got 30 tattoos. 30,000 followers, but we found lots of model actors, uh, like all of them there. So those are like the three large categories that mostly center around celebrities, fame, online, and there was also some of overlapping groups that, I just gave an example here, but it's mostly focused on ego, and I had to blur lots of things to be adequate for Black Hat, but you see, it's it's mostly what I looked for like two months, trying to look at the buyers, and it's always what came up was mostly people posting themselves. And it was maybe business related because they are bodybuilders or a web developer up there, but in the end, you're just not sure what exactly it's all about. My favorite was the one on the top corner there, who's actually ch chilling out with his Mac in the water. So yeah. So is this an ego market? And it's our uh, third researcher that came out with the name. Well, it's pretty much what we think it is. And I gave you a picture here of, uh, I think it's an actress, Selena Gomez. She's taking a picture of herself in front of people who, be, who should take pictures of her. <laughs> and we've got, uh, to the left-hand side, our prime minister, Canadian prime minister, Justin Trudeau, who's well known for actually taking pictures of himself and taking pictures, pretty much. So, yeah. 
So let's come back to our feature. We say social media fraud creating no direct victims. It's in the end that it's so peculiar and it's just creating fake fame online, right? No one's actually getting hurt. It's not ransomware. There's no law enforcement going after that. But there's still indirect victims, we could say. It's those that get fooled by false popularity. So you can think of all those bars that are hiring that singer thinking he's really popular and in the end no one's coming to drink. Or uh, those advertising companies are actually boilers of advertisements, but in the end won't get the visibility thing they, ha they have, they could have. But who's going to sort of complain for advertising companies, right? It's some part of the deal. And the Linux moves, well, I'd say but masters when they create that and they make money off it, well, they're selling it to common people and those common people are actually getting their service and they're selling it through legitimate credit cards. So they're probably even doing their taxes saying they do social marketing. Who wouldn't believe you make money by doing social marketing, right? So they're actually making money by selling to common people without ripping them. Well, they are, but they're still providing the service. And the sellers, right? So as I said earlier, I went to... Um, I went to websites and I looked at where you could buy, in, uh, buy fake fame and buy fake followers. And it's really easy. You go on Google, you write, buy fake followers, and it'll just come right away. And there's like two million websites selling that. So we uh, said that their feature is sort of they're hiding in plain sight, right? They're not selling their product in underground forums. They're selling it to common people up on the clear web. And... Mm, yeah, so they're selling it to clear web. So I give, here is an example of a website that uh, we can find really easily online. And what's interesting is that, because when we were doing the data open source ga gathering, we didn't know that Linux Moose was focusing on Instagram because we didn't have the unencrypted traffic. So I gathered information on all social networks. And you can see that most of those websites, they offer social media fraud on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, Vimeo, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Tumblr, Instagram, like all of them. It exists on all social networks. And they, they're doing a bit of social engineering, trying to look at, make it look legitimate. So they're trying to show how normal it is to buy fake fame. So they'll talk about its social marketing and they'll give consumers support and consumers feedback. And they'll say how it's normal to actually have followers and it's important and so yeah, they're doing a bit of social engineering here to, to let people like come and buy and think it's normal. Most of the prices, they are uh, in price bundles. And here I just give you an example, and it's for Instagram followers. So you go from 100 followers to 5,000, 5,000 followers, 500,000 followers. And it's always instant delivery, guaranteed quality, 100% safe, and yeah. I did this small graph here just because we had the data of the prices for 10,000 follows on each uh, social networks. We have a database of about 5,000 prices. And as you can see, LinkedIn is the most expensive one. If you want to buy 10,000 follows on that uh, social network, then it'll be 700 bucks. And I wouldn't buy, like I wouldn't pay that much. But then you get Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. And in the end, Instagram is the cheaper one. It may be the cheaper one because there's lots of supply or because it's easier to do social media fraud on that, or maybe they're, because there's more competition in between the botnets. I don't know. And uh, here's a, it's a small example of the prices on Instagram. And like I highlighted the 10,000 10, follows, which is $112 uh, for 10,000 follows. And you see next to it the standard deviation. It's, it's to show you how much the prices can vary through websites. So here it's 100 bucks. So it means that you can have actually uh, 10,000 follows for about 12 bucks, or you can have 10,000 follows for about 200 bucks. And it shows that the prices varies a lot in between websites. And usually when we have prices that are really close to each other, that, that, re that do not vary a lot, we say that it's a competitive market because they're trying to grab market shares. But the fact that you know, the prices are varying doesn't, seem that, doesn't mean that it's an uncompetitive market. It means that it's probably an immature one, so a new one, and people don't know how much the service is worth. So the sellers are actually either overpricing or underpricing because they don't know what what's the worth of this, their sales, and the buyers don't know exactly what it's worth, so they're trying to surf in between the prices, like getting the, the, the ones going to probably less um, rip them off, right? So here's a little story. So we've seen the sellers, we've, so we've seen the buyers, but we've got a little story here because uh, 
what we wanted, we, we had the malware sample, right? We started with that and we we'll built it up and we did the honeypots and then the men and mill attack and we had the traffic, but we wanted to know from where Linux Moose is actually selling. We wanted to find exactly the web platform or anything where actually Linux Moose was making profit from. So while going through the websites and gathering data, I found a website that sold, well, it wasn't a website, it was an email related to many websites and it sold Instagram uh, fake social media fraud, but it sold as well Periscope, Flippagram, and Kiwi. And those social networks, they're really not known. And all, I showed you a website earlier, they didn't sell Periscope, Flippagram, and Kiwi. I don't know if you know about those social networks, just quickly, Periscope, it's live stream. You, uh, you live stream your life and people look at you. Uh, Flippagram is just videos, a little bit shorter than YouTube, but a little bit longer than Vines. And Kiwi is a new social network where you can ask questions and uh, you'll have replies from people. So here the girl asks, if you had one last meal on earth before you die, what, would, what, what will it be? And then people will reply and start conversation like that. So yeah, I found a seller that did that and Kiwi was probably the less known one. And I went to see Olivier and I was like, well, you know, I think that could be it because he's selling exactly what we see in the traffic. So maybe it could be our masters, right? So we created a fake profile. And uh, we decided to just go, like we went downstairs, bought like a burner credit card and bought 6,000 followers, 6,000 on my fake profile, which is I'm supposed to be a young photographer. And they were provided to me, I don't know if you see it, like the first sort of up in between a weekend, right? I had my 6,000 followers. But then the day afterwards, I lost lots of them. So I decided to write, right? Write back to the master saying, well, you know, I bought 6,000 followers and like I lost 500. When I wrote it, I had lost 500, but afterwards I lost more. Could you please provide them back to me? Uh, and then I did that little story where I needed them for winter photography. And he replied, sure, adding. And then if you look back, he gave me 8,000 followers, which is great, right? I got really popular right there. And it's, it stayed like that for like a few weeks. So I was really popular, it's really nice. But then it dropped again <laughs> for like 1,000, follow, 1,100 followers. So then I said, well, the whole goal was to always ask more followers because our honeypots were still running. So what we wanted is actually to see my profile go through the honeypots so we could confirm that it's him, right? So when I lost followers, like, hey, I lost more followers, so can you push me up again? And then he replied, really badly written, I'm adding, well, followers are not forever, but I'm adding them when you ask for. And then he added me some, that's, I don't, because the, the problem is that Quintly does your, your graphs uh, for media statistics, but after two weeks it became like you needed to pay, so I had to stop following my metrics. So, and yeah, so I lost more followers, asked again, and he just stopped replying to me. So that's not true. He's not providing them whenever I ask. But and today, um, honestly, uh, my fake profile has now a thousand followers, so I lost most of them, which makes me really sad, but it's fine. And you see how much like, of a loser I am when you look at the people reacting to my pictures, which are pictures I took, right? <laughs> but the profile did go through our honeypots. So, well, it, go, it went through, it looked at my profile, and it's really not a known profile, and I couldn't be in the metrics of, you know, trending profiles. And usually, Linux Moves, what it does is it visits profile before creating a like, so we're fairly sure it's actually him. And we're pretty proud just because we went from a malware sample up to where it actually sells from its platform. So yeah, that was the, the little story here. And the last feature, large potential profitability. Well, that's because we have like lots of data and we were thinking, we know how much, how many, sorry, follows a honeypot does. We know how many follows a bot does on average, right? Not exactly, but on average, because we had many of them. So what we did is we took the average of follows they each performed and we knew the prices. And even though we, we were fairly sure it was him, the websites I talked about earlier, we still wanted to take the average price just to, in case it's not him, right? So the average price per 10,000 follows on Instagram is 0 0.0011 cent per follow. So taking into account, we know how many follows a, a bot does and how much it costs we estimated it that Linux Moves potential revenue was about 13 bucks per month per bot, which is a lot. It is a lot just because we paid 10 bucks for our servers to run our honeypots, right? So we could still do a $3 profit if you had like a legitimate botnet. 
But you know, it's probably not that. We all know that because you saw that I had free followers giving to me. So it's probably not a total, like they're not monetizing all the follows that they're doing. But it still shows you that even if, because here's a, a graph that we did. You don't see it. We had a 95% confidal, confidal intervention, but it doesn't matter. So um, that shows you if the potential revenue per month, according to the number of bots that uh, Linux Moose potentially owns. So if it owns, for example, 30,000 bots, then it would make about $400,000 per month. And that's a lot. But let's say, okay, no, he's actually monetizing half, right? Because half he's giving it away to customers who are actually complaining about it then it means that it would still do $200,000, and it's still a lot of money. So the only, the, oh yeah, and I had as well. If we can trust, because OVH was attacked, and they said that they were attacked by 1.5 terabits per second attack, and they were targeted by more than 150 devices, right? This means that there's at least 150, 150,000 devices that do have Telnet open, and that are susceptible to Linux Moose infection. And our graph is quite, well, it's not conservative, but it's still only 5, 5, 50,000 bots, right? So if we were to go like up, it would have been like insane amounts of money, and we didn't want to do that. But it still shows us that they're sort of sitting on a pot of gold. It still shows us that, because it's a lot of money you're charging to normal people, hiding in plain sight. <clears throat> Sorry. So let's do a recap here. Linux moves botnet, right? It stands on the Clever scheme where it's stealthy, it has no x86 variants, and it runs on embedded system. It's constantly adapting. When we found them first at ESA, they actually uh, modified the button quickly. It creates no direct victim. No one's actually interested into social media fraud. It doesn't, it's not like ransomware, there's no people losing money. It hides in plain sight, sells to everyone uh, through Google searches and it has a large potential profitability. So what we believe is that Linux Moose is actually some sort of a perfect cybercrime, just because it's sort of, cre it, it runs on a botnet on infected devices, that's the criminality here, but it still sells around all, it's still sort of within a scheme that's all peculiar and doesn't create victims and all that, so, and it's, makes, it's making a lot of money. So that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. We were like, yeah, we found some sort of the perfect cybercrime, except that we had to go through all this to end up with that actual <laughs> conclusion, which we call the shallowness of humanity, right? And it's so perfect that, sorry, I don't know why it's doing that, but it's so perfect that we could not raise any interest from law enforcement or hosting providers. So we went to uh, conferences where there was police and we're like, oh, we've got a botnet, it's like infecting devices, or oh, is there victims? No. Well, then they just didn't want to help us. And then we wrote to a hosting provider, hey, we've got a button, we'd like to get down and you know, with privacy, and it's normal, it's fine. But in the end, it's, we're sort of doing a call out right now saying, well, if you want some people to stop making money off a botnet, well, we're here and we can help you. And we, we like to say that we lost faith in humanity. <laughs> until, until we saw this, which is a buyer and it's called dogs with more money than you. <laughs> so that just gives you more faith, right? So thank you very much. And just quickly, we invite you to do more like mixed research if ever you want to do that, because it's really nice. You get the technical lities around the botnet, but also the market and how it works and how it makes money. So uh, thank you very much. And you've got the Linux, Linux Moose IOCs on GitHub, ESET, and our research paper on gosecure.net slash blog. Thank you. Any questions? This is quite uh, of using a botnet instead of just a server and perhaps uh, maybe this sort of fraud because it's uh, harder to uh, protect from botnets, IP address wise. Or you? Yeah. So the, the reason is the, the clean IP addresses is that if you infect consumer routers, you have IP addresses that are coming from DSL or cable, which are really legitimate. And so I, we think that if like Instagram saw a lot of requests coming from OVH or from hosting providers, they will definitely flag them more likely as spam, especially if there are several users behind the same IP address. So really about leveraging what we call clean IP addresses in the, in the paper. It's a good question. Any other questions? Well, enjoy your last day. Yep, enjoy Black Hat and see you guys around. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>